Well, I'm glad that uh, we have this chance to be together. And um, Kelly Sue, thank you so much for the gift of the salt. Now we can all go home and say we've all been assaulted at church. Ha! <laughs> huh? Some of you were thinking it. Admit it. Come on. Yeah. This is cute, actually. Well, good to be able to worship with you. We're going to go from first, Timory, to talking about the finish and being finishers. Let's bow our heads. Gracious God in heaven, we just worship you today and we dedicate once more our time, our thoughts, our attention to you. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about the finishers and what that means. But we're going to start with a quiz this morning and just a few questions for the young people. If you will raise your hands. Oh, yeah, Toby, if you'd help me out, it would be great. Got the black one here, Owen. Yeah, raise your hand. I see Andre already put up his hand. So go ahead and go to Andre here. Who? Uh, where was Jesus when he said, it is finished? Where was he? He was. That is right. Very good. Thank you. That's where he was. He was on the cross when he said it was finished. Number two, where was Paul when he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Where was he when he wrote that? Yeah, Owen's already looking at the answers, so I don't know if that's allowed. (laughs) Anyone know of our young people? Where was he? It's not a city per se. Eric? Over here says he wants to give it a try. Head on over here. Thank you. Where was he? In prison. That is right. He was in prison. Uh, We think it was a prison called Mamertine in Rome. Just a quick picture of Mamertine here. Um, Although it looks very posh now because it's been turned into a tourist attraction. There's actually a church and a chapel built. Any of you been there? Any of you been to the Mamertine prison? Uh, I did get to look at it through one of the side holes. We didn't actually do the tour when we were there in Rome, but um, it was basically not much more than a hole in the ground, and that may have been where Paul spent some of his last days before his martyrdom. All right, where was John when he wrote the words that the mystery of God is finished? And just note where it is, Revelation Uh, Where was he when he wrote that the mystery of God is finished? Where was he living? Where was he when he wrote that? Where was he when he wrote the book of Revelation? Come on, young people. You know your Bibles. Andre's raring to go. I see that. Vitor, what do you think? Got anything there? Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? I understand. Anna, are we here today? Is, Is it happening? No, it's not happening. All right, come on over to Andre. Oh, did I miss someone over here? Oh, I I may have missed a hand, but uh, Andre? Thank you, Andre. You're going to be awesome. Um, That island where he was, like, imprisoned. That island where he was, where he was imprisoned. Does anyone in your family know that? (laughs) It's in Portuguese, it's Patmos. Well, in English, we say it very different. We say Patmos. So I don't, yeah, the Portuguese is tough for me, but yeah, English. Yes, he was on the Isle of Patmos. He was exiled. They had sent him there kind of as uh, imprisonment, kind of just to get him out of the way. At this point, they were kind of afraid to keep martyring the Christians, and so they tried something different with John. He does get off the Isle of Patmos later on in life. But just interestingly, these three kind of references to things being finished, you have Jesus on the cross, you have Paul in prison, you have uh, John in exile, all of them expressing some level of appreciation that God has been with them to the point where they can finish what God had called them to do. One more question for our young people today. Fill in the blank. This is from Philippians. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will do this until the day of Christ Jesus. What is that missing word? Do you know? We're all kind of tired this morning, it seems like. We don't have quite as many of our young people here. Anyone know what that missing word is? 
Oh, <laughs> go ahead, let Bailey say it. Finish. Finish. Well, or Sean. Go ahead. Okay, so there's different ways it can be translated. For he who began a good work in you will, I put it here as, it, it kind of means the same thing as finish, but will perfect it or complete it or finish it until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you, son. I appreciate your help. So we're going to be talking about the finishers here today. You know, starting something is generally easier than finishing it. Have you noticed that? Any of you ever started a diet? Yeah. You ever have some resolution maybe that you've started? Maybe an exercise plan? Yeah, I'm going to you know, lose that weight before the big event or you know, before the bathing suit goes on or whatever. I'm going to start it. Starting is generally easier. Would you agree with that? Starting a chore, starting anything, you know, starting a ministry. You know, oh, we can get it started, but to maintain it, to keep it organized, to keep it going, and to finish it, two very different things, two very different things. And uh, it presents us with a challenge. I'm impressed with those who are able to finish what they've started because there's an awful lot of things in life that we start and we don't finish. Even things like running a marathon. Have you done a marathon, Mark? Yeah? How many? Just three? Okay. I'm not very impressed with that. Um, only about, um, of the major marathons, about 20% of the runners never finish, uh, when I looked it up at least, it, about 20%, even though these are trained athletes that have to submit times from other uh, races in order to even qualify to be in the major marathons, like the Chicago Marathon or the Boston or Seattle, any of these major ones, the Austin one, Tokyo, um, they, uh, about 20% of them will never cross the finish line. Um, and uh, so starting something very different than finishing it. Some things seem like they never finish, um, like the dishes. You ever notice that the dishes are never done? Laundry. It's like you just finished folding that last towel, putting it away, and then the, the kids come in, oh, I forgot my whole thing here. And it's just like some things feel like they're never done. And for sometimes in the Christian walk, it can feel like we never quite get it done. We just think we've got order in our life. We just think that we've figured something out. Uh, you know, we've just got a little money and savings ready for the vacation, and then the car breaks down, right? And we just think we're never going to get to that finish line. Or, or we think that spiritually we've just gotten one thing in our life in order, and then all of a sudden something else falls apart. And sometimes Christianity or the Christian walk can feel a little bit like a chore, kind of like the dishes are never done. And it can be quite discouraging. What does it take to be a finisher? What does it look like to finish in the Christian life? Last week I talked a little bit about D-Day, and I'm not going to dwell on that again. I'm just going to kind of dovetail in. D-Day last week was talking about having the confidence and courage to get onto the uh uh, you know, onto the ships and to, to, to storm the, beach, the beaches and establish that beachhead in, or that foothold in enemy territory and what it takes to be able to have the courage and confidence to be able to do that. But once you're there, the mission isn't over, right? Just because we've gotten to that certain point doesn't mean that the war is done, right? We still have to finish the mission. Just because we've started down the course with Jesus Christ, just because we have began uh, to, to understand what God's purpose in our lives and begin to organize our lives around the, the expectations and the mission that God has given us, we still have a job to do before it is all finished. And we need to not just get to the place of being there on that beachhead, but we want to finish. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I actually have um, some, uh, before we get all the way down to verse 15, um, I want to highlight the entire chapter speaks to the topic that I want to share with you this morning, um, but I just want to share a couple of uh, passages before we get to verse 15. So I'm going to actually start in verse 7. And Paul's been talking about this journey that we're on. He's been talking about the struggles. He's been talking about the challenges that we face and how we need to uh, remain steadfast and understand what the new covenant is and all these things. In verse 7, though, just to, to get right into it, Paul says this, We have this treasure in earthen vessels 
so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God will be of God and not of ourselves. He's talking about the treasure of the knowledge of the mercy of God. He's talking about the gospel. We have the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. We have the truth of salvation in us. And he says it's like we have treasure in earthen vessels or in jars of clay. And really what he's making is this dramatic contrast because in that day and culture, you would never put something of vast, a great value in something as fragile as a jar of clay. It'd be kind of like going to someone's house and they say, hey, I want to show you something. I, I have this wonderful thing. It's, a, it's a, a check from my rich uncle that he wrote me. It's a million dollars. Wow, that's great. Well, why don't you have it in the bank or what are you doing with it? No, no, I keep it in a shoebox right by the fireplace. And then I light candles around it when I think of an uh, old uncle who died. You'd be like, but that doesn't make sense. That's vulnerable. Why would you keep something so valuable in such a, a, a fragile location? But that's exactly what Paul is saying. The knowledge that we have, the grace that we've received, the mercy of Jesus Christ has been given to us and we are incredibly fragile. We are incredibly prone to weakness and failure and brokenness. Yet God has entrusted it to us so that when it's received by others, we don't get the credit. All credit goes to God. Instead of people looking at us and saying, well, you're so strong and you're so wonderful and you've been able to do these wonderful things. No, we are weak. We are fragile. But God has entrusted the knowledge of salvation to us. He's given it to us. And so Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power uh, will be of God and not of ourselves. For we are afflicted in every way, not crushed, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. He's again talking about that fragileness. All of these things that we are afflicted with, but yet we are not totally uh, uh, eliminated from the story. Verse 10, always caring about us in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being li- delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So what Paul is saying here is saying, in, as a Christian, we live with the reality that Jesus has died, and that we are dead to this world. So that even if we too perish, that doesn't the, that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not the life of Christ can be translated and transmitted to others. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. Again, verse 11. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. He goes on to say in verse 15, For all things are for your sakes. And so that's where I want to pick it up here now on the screen in verse 15. How we can become the finishers. He says, all things are for your sakes. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, he says, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. This treasure that we have in earth and vessels, this grace that can transform hearts and minds, as it reaches more and more people, great thanksgiving, God receives glory. And then he says this, that is why we never give up. That is why. This is why we never surrender. We don't give in to doubt or despair. That is why we never give. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. And I wanted you just to notice what he refers to when he says that is why. Two reasons why that we are given confidence, that we are given encouragement, that we are given a, 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 a motivation to not give up the fight. Because as God works through us, people receive grace. People receiving grace, that is why we never give up. Is because as God works through us, others are receiving the same mercy that we have received. He says that in verse 1 of chapter 4. Because people are receiving grace and God is getting glory. These are the two realities that help us in our Christian walk. I, I'm probably not the only Christian here who has ever at one moment or another in my life kind of looked at myself in the mirror or stood before God and said, you know what, this, this life is kind of rough. I mean, the, the things that people say about me and the, 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 the limitations that I seem to have in life and all the factors in, in, in this world that seem to be pressuring me in a different way, I'm not so sure I want to go this direction anymore. Am I the only Christian here who's ever had the thought of it's maybe it's time to give up? 
I, I don't think I am. I think at one time or another in our life, we have had that, that crucial moment where we're not quite sure what God expects of us or what the next step is or whether the entire journey is worth it to begin with. And Paul here in 2 Corinthians makes it very clear. It's not about you. As God works through you, people will receive mercy and freedom and glory. And that's what they were doing on D-Day. They were bringing salvation to uh, uh, the people who were in, being oppressed by the Nazis. It's not about you. It's about other people receiving grace and mercy and salvation in Jesus Christ. And because of that, the same God who extended mercy to you receives all the glory. That is why some of your Bibles say we do not lose heart. But that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed day by day. Our present troubles are small and won't last long. Now, again, when Paul says that, you have to remember, Paul's in, he, he, he is already, he says in 2 Corinthians, all the troubles that he's had, all the persecutions, all the lashings, all the shipwrecks, all the nakedness, all the hunger that he's experienced. He has every right to say our present troubles are small. Sometimes I tend to say, well, Paul, you don't know what I'm going through. I could not find a parking space the other day. And that just really ruined my day, Paul. You don't know that. No, Paul knows great trial. Paul knows great persecution. And if Paul can say our present troubles are small, he who'd been in prison, he who'd been beaten, he who'd had been stoned, been shipwrecked, then, then he can say to us today that indeed too, our troubles in the light of eternity are also small. And they won't last very long, yet they produce for us glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I just want to uh, hesitate on that last part there. For the things we see now will soon be gone. What is he talking about there? What, is, what are the things that we see now that are passing away? All of the misery, all of the disease, all of the discouragement and disorder, all of the oppression and persecution, all that sin has brought rack and ruin to in this world is not going to last forever. Amen? Those things, though they are here now, Though they cause us great distress, though we are greatly perplexed, though we face great trials at times, those things will not last forever. But the things of God, the character of God, the plan of God, the salvation of God, that is where our focus should be because those things last forever. So just two, two, suggestions, two suggestions on what it takes to be a finisher. I really admire those who can start a journey like walking the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Coast Trail. You know, that takes weeks to do that. Or to run a marathon, to complete a major task in life, to give up an addiction. You know, those who've struggled with alcohol or tobacco for years, but then they find victory and they're able to get to that finish line and say, I am free. Don't you admire that? I admire those. And I look at that in my own life and I want to have the same ability to say like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Or like Paul would say, no matter the circumstances, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. What does it take to be a finisher? And I would just give you two, two observations this morning. One, we need to focus first and foremost on the mission and not on ourselves. And this is the big challenge of human nature. This is the big challenge of Christianity. This is the big challenge for us all to remember that it's not all about us. Christ didn't come for himself. Christ came for others. And as Christians, we are to live with a focus and a mission on others, others first. Think about Hebrews 12, 2 for a second. The, well, one of the greatest passages, Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3. But just here in verse 2, uh, it says this, that we are to be fixing our eyes on Jesus, 
The author, and here's that same idea. He is the one, if he starts something good in us, he's not going to leave it alone. He's not going to ignore it. He's not going to just leave us on our own. He is going to be with us until that good thing has been perfected. He is the author and perfecter of faith. And then he says this, who for the, what's that word? All three of you are listening. I'm glad for that. Who for the, say it together, who for the joy. Oh, that wasn't very joyful either. That's joy. Uh, so much joy. Uh. Can we try it just one more time? Who for the joy set before him. That's a little better. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know it's hot. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy? What joy? What was the joy that made Jesus say the cross is worth it? What was he focused on at that time of great trial when he is totally abandoned? He feels abandoned by everyone. What was the joy? Yes, yes, yes. Good stuff. Absolutely. Do you think the joy was that when it was all said and done and he'd resurrected from the dead and and he had fulfilled all that, that he could stand before God and say, God, I did it. I'm so glad I did it. It's me. And, and now I'm a wonderful person and, and I'm the best and I'm the, that's what I, that's why I did it because I'm so great. Was that the joy? The joy that kept Jesus nailed to that cross. The whole purpose of Jesus allowing that experiment, it was so that you and I could have the hope of salvation. So that his, from his perfect life, You were the joy. Do you get it? You were the joy. You were the reason. You were the opportunity that God saw when he hung on the cross. That was the joy. It wasn't just for himself. Oh man, I'm a perfect guy. No, yes, he was perfect. Yes, he's the son of God. Yes, he is the perfect sacrifice. But the joy was that his children could be set free. When we remember that the reason that God has called us into His family, the reason that He has set us free, the reason that He has given us grace and mercy, is not so that we could just sit back on our heels and become spiritual porkers and just kind of grow, oh, all this grace, just keep pouring it in, God. Keep pouring it in. I just want more of it for me. God made us these, this way so that we could be conduits of that grace and mercy for others. Remember that the mission is still being fulfilled in your life and in my life. And when we think and we're tempted and the devil comes to us and say, well, why don't you just throw in the towel? Why don't you give up? This marathon is too long. By the way, uh, oh, did I scare Mark? Did I use his name too many times? Did I offend him? Okay. I read that it's around mile 20 that marathon runners typically give up. They call it hitting the wall. Have you hit the wall before, Bambi? Yeah, well, well, I understand. Uh, But that, you know, sometimes in our Christian walk, we think we hit the wall and we want to say, well, uh, I guess I'm just not going to do it anymore. But when you remember that it's not just about your life and about your victory and about your freedom and about your joy, it's about how God wants you to help others. It gives you a different perspective. And it gives you the ability, and the Holy Spirit can work through that and say, don't give up, because if you give up, it's not just your life that may be lost. It's all the others that I intend to reach through you. And think about those soldiers. Have they given up? If they'd not continued the mission? Yes, maybe they would have lived as some of them have died, but what would the world have been different if the Allies had said, let's just leave Europe to the Germans? Let's just, let's go back to our own countries Think about how the world would be different. But the fact that they kept focused on the mission. We are here to set others free. And that makes it worth it. And I will stick with the mission until it is finished. Focus on the mission. Who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Secondly, and again, I realize these things are not you know, new or profound, but I just think they're, they, they're worth repeating. Have faith in Christ and not in yourself. 
It's not all about your abilities and your holiness and your, your skills and strength to do this. It's about your ability to focus and allow Jesus Christ in your life. And so just one verse that I like to illustrate that, coming from the same book uh, that we read, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from, at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says this. He says, as you're going through this journey and as you're looking for evidence of God's blessing, as you're looking for, for ways to know that God is with you and that you're on the right course, he says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. And, and he, he's saying here, he's saying the same thing that, that Psalms 139 says about when, when uh, Psalm says, seek me and know me, search me, see if there be any evil in me. He's, Paul's saying the same thing. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable to God. Don't be afraid to be honest with yourself. Don't be afraid to be transparent with where you are in your walk with God. He says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you. He's in you. He's with you. You're not alone in this journey. The same Jesus who was successful in his ministry, the same Jesus who was an overcomer, the same Jesus who relied upon uh, prayer and his relationship with the Father, the same Jesus who was able to uh, uh, go all the way through the temptations and be uh, uh, on the cross and say, it is finished, that same Jesus is in you. We are not having to do this on our own. And not only that, he gives us the victory that, it, that we ourselves could never earn. So we're not just, when, when we're tempted to throw in the towel, when we're, fem, when we're tempted to forego the mission, remember that there is one inside of you who never fails. There is one inside of you by faith that you have invited, that is on the throne of your heart, who is able to make you successful who is able to make you go through those tough times as challenging as they may seem. He'll, make, he'll help you push through that wall so that the finish line is achievable. Remember that Jesus Christ is with you. We are living in very strange days. We're living in days that I hardly recognize my country anymore at times. If you read the news at all, if you watch television at all, and you even see the commercials, do any of you ever look at those and say, I don't even know what is going on in this world right now? God is looking for a church. He is looking for a people who will persevere and will finish the work before He returns again. to bring us all to His heavenly kingdom. We need to be focused on finishing the mission. And every single one of us have a role. Every single one of us has a specific thing that God is calling us to. It may be small, it may be behind the scenes, it may be grand, it may be highly visible and significant. But whatever it is, every single person here, God has a plan for you to fulfill in his work in these last days. And the devil is doing everything he can to say, give up. The world is mine. I control the theaters. I control the news. I control the politics. I control the schools. And I've just about got control of the church as well. What's the point? Give up. But we have a victorious Savior in every single one of us. And we have a mission. Focus on the mission and keep your faith in Jesus Christ. And you will be among those, like Paul, to say, I have finished the course. By God's grace, by His power, because He dwells in me. Focus on the mission and have faith in Jesus Christ. Is that a good thing to do? Is that a good reminder for us all? I hope so. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you, Lord, that we can be reminded of these things. Thank you for the stories that we have in the Bible and the inspiration that we get from uh, the Scriptures. Thank you that the Apostle Paul was uh, your servant and able to write these things thousands of years ago that we could benefit from them today. Thank you, Lord. We know that every single one of us is here for a reason. And we may not know specifically what that is. We may have an idea. We may be afraid to step forward. But Lord, help us to remember that you are with us, that we're not alone, and that we have a mission. And that mission is essential to the salvation of souls that are waiting for us. Thank you, Jesus. We ask this in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Remember camp meeting next week. Uh, we do have potluck uh, right now over in our fellowship hall, so if you can stay in fellowship with us, that would be great. Other than that, happy Sabbath.